This is my Canyon Air Road. I imagine you'll probably be quite familiar with it, in part because I ride it all the time, and so it's in loads of GCM videos, but also because this already has its own pro bike video. And that means that, yep, this is one of the few bikes in the whole world to have two GCN videos about it. Now, one reason I think it deserves it, because it is so drop-dead gorgeous, in my eyes at least. But actually the main reason is, in the last year, quite a lot on it has changed. The whole group set, the wheel set, and even the geometry. So what is the Canyon Aero then? Well, it is, as the name suggests actually, the aerodynamic bike in Canyon's range. And one of the questions we get asked a lot here on GCN is, can you actually feel the difference between an aerodynamic bike and a non-aerodynamic bike? And the honest answer is, yes, you can actually tell the difference, I think, out on the road. On most of my rides on an aero bike, I'm a good one to two kilometers per hour faster on average than I would be on a non-aerodynamic bike. Now that may or may not matter to you, but the difference, I think, is quite significant. Then the other question that we get asked a lot is what size bikes we ride. So this one is a medium and I am 185 centimeters tall or six foot one. And so that probably comes up a little bit on the small side, but it is the way I like it. It's quite short. And even though there is quite a lot of steerer tube hanging out there, and a lot of you have pointed out on many occasions that I needed to slam that stem, there is quite a lot of drop between the saddle and the bars. In fact, there is 12 centimeters, which is plenty for my aging back. It's not that old, but you know what I mean? And then what about the geometry? Well, I said that I had changed it, which sounds a little bit peculiar, but there was a feature on it that I didn't even know existed until I went to Canyon's factory and they kindly pointed it out. In the front forks, there is a little wedge and you can move that wedge either into position one or position two. And what that changes is the rake on the fork. And even though it's only a few millimeters, the difference is actually quite significant and so it comes as standard in the slower handling position and then when I found out about it I moved it just to see what it was like and actually I much prefer it in the faster handling position so I thought that was quite interesting and indeed that is the way I continue to ride it now nice and fast possibly borderline a bit twitchy one of the other things that I said I'd changed was the group set and I guess you can see pretty clearly that it now has SRAM Red ETAP on there. I put it on in about February or March time when I was fortunate enough to get hold of a group set and in that time I have, it's fair to say, fallen in love with it. It's been absolutely great. It's alive! <laughs> but it's not a full SRAM group set, as you can see. I've still got the Shimano Dura-Ace brakes on there, and that's because at the moment, SRAM actually don't make the direct mount brakes. So like Team Katusha, in fact, I've still got Dura-Ace brakes on there, which pains me slightly. I love SRAM, I love Shimano, but mixing the two just doesn't feel quite right. So hopefully at some point soon, I'm gonna be able to put a full SRAM group set on there. And then the other thing that's changed is the crank set. I've got a rotor twin power power meter on there. And I do love riding with power, even though I'm not training specifically for things anymore. Actually having numbers in front of me has kind of spiced up certain rides. I do like having a target. I've also got a fairly interesting choice of chain rings on there, I suppose. I've got 3952, which I know that sounds a bit peculiar, but I really like having a standard size inner ring, so a 39. I don't actually need a compact for most of the riding that I do because I don't have any super long climbs. Whereas the 52, I will admit 53 is a little bit tall for me these days, whereas a 52 keeps me in the big ring for longer and that's kind of how I like to ride. The other thing that allows me to get away with the 5239 is the fact that I've got an almost standard now 1128 cassette on there. The third and final thing that I said I'd change on here was the wheel set. Now, last time you saw this bike in pro bike form, it had Zips 808 NSW wheels in it. And now I've got the slightly shallower 404 NSWs. And if truth be told, these are the ones that I spend most of my time on, even though the 808s are still around. And if I can wrestle them off Dan, I will sometimes use them. But these ones are a little bit lighter. So although the deeper section wheels are faster, these ones, being a little bit lighter, I think are more responsive. And a lot of the roads that we have here in the UK are really tight, 
the twisty with short, steep climbs and steep descents, and actually having a slightly lighter wheel does make the bike a little bit easier to handle. It's a bit quicker to throw around. And so that is predominantly why I've got the slightly shallower ones on there. But I haven't gone shallower still because I do still like the aerodynamics. Having spent a little bit of time in wind tunnels this year, I'm getting more and more into it. I do see the benefits as being more and more tangible. Then tires, well, I did have 28s on there on those 808s. Now I've got 25s on there. And that's not necessarily a conscious decision. It is, truth be told, just what was on there. I quite like the fact that this aero bike does have clearance for 28s. They are really comfortable. We've had an amazing year here at GCN and this bike has been on some seriously good trips. Firstly, it's got to be said, when Matt and I went out to Italy for the Giro, and we previewed one of the stages with that pretty nasty gravel climb right near the end, the Alpe di Potti, and this bike came with me. And then off camera, actually, on that trip, I also got to hit up some of the white roads of Tuscany, having got up super early one day. And that was a fantastic ride. And then I also came out to San Francisco with me, where the pair of us went up some pretty nasty, famously steep climbs in the city. But then we also took a little trip over the Golden Gate Bridge and for a beautiful spin around Marin Headlands. That is a ride that I will treasure for a long time. The fact that this bike then ended up spending a week in Iceland because it got lost on the plane on the way home is neither here nor there, but I was mighty relieved when we were reunited, it has to be said. Now, if you like this bike, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And then also let me know what you think about it in the comments section. Are you a fan of murdered out bikes or does it need a little bit more color? And in fact, if you've got any questions you wanna ask me about this bike, then again, let me know in the comments section down below and I'll do my best to answer them. Now, if you wanna see more pro bikes on GCN, then make sure first of all that you are a subscriber of the channel because then you're in the right place to see all of the pro bikes that we upload. There is at least one per week. And then, right now, more content. Well, you could check out Tom Last's pro bike, his beautiful Trek Madon that I'm not sure whether he's mentioned, but he actually designed the color scheme himself. And then we've also got a genuine pro bike version of a Canyon Aeroad from Team Katusha, and that is just over there.